Well, um, this is going to be, uh, first off, since I'm being recorded, I'm going to be watching my P's and Q's. Um, and so you guys keep that in mind with the questions as well. Um, but uh, thanks for having me. Um, this will be a, in some ways, a cynical and dark presentation, but we're going to end on an uptick with a positive uh, finish. So uh, the good news really doesn't come until the end of the presentation. But before I jump in, I want to commend all of you. Um, I, I think it's, and forgive me if I get this quote wrong, is that Groucho Marx said that he would not want to be a member of any club that would have it. And I, I typically feel that way, but the Mountaineers would be a very big glaring exception to that. Um, I think that the objectives of uh, fostering um, a love for the outdoors, preservation of the environment, uh, advocating for wild places, and educating people about how to safely play in the outdoors, I think those are things that have uh, enormous uh, societal impact. Um, I grew up in Lafayette, Louisiana. I've been out west for 35 years, but I grew up in a state where the high point of the state was about 300 feet. And let's see, is Richard from Olympia, is he in here that we were talking earlier? No, he skedaddled. But uh, I sat next to a man today that actually lived within a mile of me when I was growing up in Lafayette, which is bizarre. But the reason I mention that is because I think that here in the Pacific Northwest, we're so lucky to live in proximity to such spectacular places like the North Cascades, Mount Rainier, uh, the Olympics, you know, the list is, uh, uh, we could go on for, uh, forever. And the fact that you guys um, are willing to give your time to foster uh, a care for the outdoors, for the environment, and fostering, uh, getting, especially now with the younger generation, getting them out into the outdoors. And where's our young volunteers here? Let's give them a hand. And thankfully, I think we got the computer gear set up without having to ask them to intervene. <laughs> is a new one for me. But I think that the Mountaineers is a fantastic organization, and it really gives me a warm and fuzzy to come here and talk to you guys. And hopefully there's going to be some takeaways that are going to be uh, helpful. And I, I, we've got plenty of time here this morning. We have till 1030. So let's make this interactive. If you have a question, please uh, weigh in and I'd be glad to discuss it with you. Um, because I think you'd be surprised at how similar uh, the questions that you may have about liability issues are also uh, on the radar screen for other people. And uh, let's see. It's, we're already going to need some assistance. Am I standing too far away from this? You know, we can do without the room. How about that? Okay, so um, you've already heard a little bit about me, but my partner Ruth Nielsen and I are basically, I think it's fair to say, we're the outdoor liability lawyers for uh, the state of Washington. We represent all of the ski areas in Washington. Do we have any employees of Stevens or Crystal or the Summit with us today? How about any season pass holders? All right, that's what we like to see. Um, yes, and the snow's coming, I promise. Um, uh, so Ruth and I, uh, we represent all of the ski areas in Washington. Um, I split time between here and Jackson Hole. I've been doing that for about 10 years. And I do work for the ski areas back there. I do work for some of the guide services back there uh, for search and rescue. And so um, I've been fortunate enough to be able to uh, combine my personal life and my zeal and my passion for the outdoors uh, with making a living, which is really, really nice. Um, I really love climbing and skiing. I'm not necessarily the best climber. Um, that's a picture of me on the uh, uh, split pillar at Squamish. Uh, anybody ever climbed that here? Any? Nobody. Anybody climbed at Squamish before? Yeah, I, I, not that this is, it, uh, needs an endorsement, but my gosh, it's spectacular up there. And it's so fun. The approaches are like five minutes away. Whereas in Jackson, you hike for four hours for three pitches of climbing. In Squamish, you hike for 10 minutes for 20 pitches. So um, I highly encourage you to get up there. But I love the outdoors, and I love um, uh, playing in it. And I think that it's given me at least a good point of reference for dealing with uh, liability issues. 
Um, so believe it or not, this picture was taken, um, this is President's Day weekend at Snoqualmie, right after the ski bus kids had gotten off. Um, actually, that, that's not true. Um, this is in the middle of uh, British Columbia somewhere. Yeah. Although I think, I think once upon a time, like on a Wednesday afternoon, there may, there, there may have been a day like this at Snoqualmie, so. Uh, okay, so today what I'm hoping to impart you with is more uh, how to frame things as a volunteer leader and how to have liability issues um, on your radar screen rather than leave you with hard and fast legal uh, maxims, case law, statutes. And we're going to talk a little bit about the fine details, but largely what I'm hoping to impart you with is more of a mindset. And I think that that mindset will serve you well, not only to protect yourself, but also to protect the, or, uh, the Mountaineers organization. And I think that, that we can all agree that the Mountaineers uh, is an organization worth protecting. And liability uh, is an issue that should concern us all because it adds to cost, it, adds to, uh, it can limit opportunities uh, in the future. And so it's something that we need to be cognizant of. But that's the main thing that I want to do here today is impart a mindset for you. And so I think that the way that, that, that I've set this presentation up, and my apologies if some of you were here last year and some of this seems repetitive, hopefully not, but the way that I've set this up is to discuss what I think are some sort of mindset, tra mindset traps that you can fall into because you're a volunteer, and hopefully uh, I can uh, show you uh, the air of potentially falling into some of these traps and then some protections that are available to you. So let's go ahead and start with a little bit of dark cynicism, um, which always, a good lead into that, is a picture of some daisies. Um, so, a little ironic here. I, I think a kitchen table or front porch sense of justice and fairness says, well, I'm a volunteer. I'm uh, giving my time. I'm trying to foster big picture societal goals. I'm helping people. Why do I need to be worried about liability? And I agree with you completely from a kitchen table uh, or front porch uh, justice perspective or fairness perspective. That's absolutely true. Unfortunately, frequently in the law, what seems to be fair and just from a kitchen table perspective and just plain old common sense somehow goes out the window. Sometimes it works that way, but a lot of times it doesn't. And this is a prime example. So if the first thing you're thinking as you are uh, giving up your time as a volunteer and as a trip leader, and I say as a trip leader, that's my main, I guess my main focus today would be your roles as trip leaders, but we can talk about some other scenarios as well. But as you are giving up your time, don't fall into the mindset well, I'm a volunteer and liability is not really something that I need to worry about. Now, there are some immunities and some protections available, and we're going to talk about those later. But from a mindset perspective, don't be thinking, well, I'm a volunteer, so I don't have to sweat liability issues. I thought it was interesting to note um, when, uh, in the opening remarks this morning, that there was a discussion about fostering um, interactive or, uh, I, I guess, uh, cross-pollination with some of the guide services and with professional guides and some of the climbing leaders. Um, I think that that's a very helpful um, uh, push by the Mountaineers because um, for any of you who are, I do work for some of the guides associations, and for those of you who are familiar with it, organizations like the uh, AMGA, the American uh, Mountain Guides Association, the, the people who go through those programs, they have virtual PhDs in their various disciplines, whether it's rock climbing, backcountry skiing, mountaineering, or combined, when you're a full mountain guide, you are basically a PhD. And um, what I have heard from one of the former presidents of the AMGA is that to truly master some of these mountain disciplines, you need to spend about 10,000 hours doing it. Um, I'm hoping in the next couple of years to uh, tally about that much skiing, but we'll see what happens. But in the meantime, um, the, the guide services and professional guides are a great source of information. And the reason I bring that up 
is that you may be thinking as a trip leader and as a volunteer, I'm not a paid guide and I'm therefore held to a different standard. And I think in some senses that's true, but in some senses it's, some senses it's, it's not. And from a liability perspective, um, I would submit to you that as a volunteer, you are going to be held to the almost the same standards, if not identical standards, as a professional guide. I think the difference between a professional guide and a volunteer has far more to do with customer service than it does with uh, the nuts and bolts of a particular activity. So let's say if we're talking about mountaineering or backcountry skiing, for example, if you're leading a trip up uh, Mount Rainier as a professional guide, um, you may also, in hopes of getting some return customers, and just because it's been ingrained in you as a customer serve, from a customer service perspective, you may be inclined to, well, gee, I'm going to get up earlier than everybody else. I'm going to get the stove going. I'm going to get the coffee brewed. I'm going to make sure everybody can put on their crampons. I'm going to check everyone, uh, their feet for blisters, things that have more to do with creature comforts than actual safety. But when it comes to the nuts and bolts of a mountaineering trip, for example, I would say there's absolutely no difference from a liability perspective for you as a volunteer when it comes to making sure that people are roped up when they should be, that the knots are tied properly, that their harnesses are on correctly, um, that you're taking necessary precautions, that you're evaluating rockfall and avalanche issues. No difference between you as a volunteer and those paid guys out there who may have 10, 15, 20,000 hours under their belt. And that's a sobering thought. And I'm gonna, like I said, hopefully at the end, leave you with some, uh, 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 we'll end on a positive note, but keep that in mind, that the difference between you as a, tri as a trip leader and a paid guide, I would submit is really only related to customer service and comfort issues. When it comes to safety, I would say there's absolutely no distinction. Um, and uh, the standards that you're going to be judged by may very well, well first off, they're going to come out of the Mountaineers Freedom of the Hills book. Um, keep that in mind, that you're going to be held responsible for that. And we'll talk about that in a little while. But that's point number one. Don't fall into the trap that you're going to let your guard down because you're a volunteer that's not being paid. So the fact that you're not getting a salary and the fact that the volunteers or that the uh, Mountaineers is a nonprofit, it only has a little bit of relevance. And we're going to talk about that as it relates to immunity, immunities and protections later. But um, the, you can't go to sleep and you can't let your guard down and you can't disregard the training that you've received in whatever discipline we're discussing where you're acting as a trip leader. Um, simply because of the Mountaineer's nonprofit status or the fact that you are not being paid. Now, uh, that has nothing to do with customer service and creature comforts and those sorts of things. Um, but that's a, that's a topic that we can save for another day. Okay. So, um, when we're talking about liability and talking about lawsuits, first and foremost, what we're talking about is negligence. I would say that in, in an outdoor context, 99% of all lawsuits that where uh, your conduct as a volunteer is going to be scrutinized, it falls in the realm of something known as negligence. And negligence is something that uh, I think that the average person on the street thinks that they have a working definition of it, which is, well, uh, somebody did something wrong, or something bad happened. And unfortunately, that's something we as lawyers in defending some of these lawsuits have to battle all the time, is educating our jurors in some of these lawsuits that negligence is not such a fuzzy, abstract standard. And negligence is certainly not, well, somebody got hurt, so somebody must be responsible. And the people who that we are uh, frequently uh, at war with, and that's a sad metaphor, and that's probably an improper metaphor. The people that we're engaged, that we're uh, uh, litigating these cases against, they typically start from, well, somebody got hurt, so therefore something must have been negligent. 
But that's not the actual definition. So let's take a look at the definition and then how that applies to you guys as volunteers. So the first working term that needs to be applied in a general negligence definition is this definition of ordinary care. And this is actually a, uh, a definition where uh, common sense and uh, kitchen table fairness does come into play. So you'll see it's ordinary care for an adult or legal entity such as a corporation like the Mountaineers. Um, uh, it means the care that a reasonably careful adult person or corporation would exercise under the same or similar circumstances. So this is a definition that jurors actually get in, a, in an instruction packet when they sit as jurors in a negligence uh, liability lawsuit. Let me see a show of hands of, of who's been on jury duty before. Oh man, a lot of you. And um, okay, well the way that it works is that um, unlike TV, it's not just two lawyers standing up and making really uh, eloquent arguments. And also on TV, the lawyers are much better looking. But uh, <laughs> and believe me, that's true. Um, I'm making it late. So um, the way that it works in real life is that the jurors are given an instruction packet. And that actually is a packet prepared by the judge that the lawyers spend an inordinate amount of time fighting over. And that packet defines the law for the jurors. And then what happens is that the lawyers, after all the evidence is presented and the witnesses testify, the lawyers in closing argument, it's not really about uh, using clever quotes from Walt Whitman or uh, a lot of high drama. It's mostly just the nuts and bolts of here's what the instructions say and here's why the facts in this case should lead you to a certain result. And so this definition of ordinary care in a liability, a liability lawsuit that would uh, likely uh, be a scenario that you'd be involved in as a volunteer with the Mountaineers would have this definition in the packet. So keep that in mind um, when you are uh, leading one of these trips or serving as a volunteer leader that you want to be thinking in terms of, am I exercising the type of care that an ordinary person, i.e., and we'll discuss this in a few minutes, i.e., another trip leader or, unfortunately, a professional guide, am I exercising the same type of care to keep people on this trip safe? Um, and so that's going to be sort of the really, really big picture standard that you're going to be governed by. And so the ordinary care definition is then worked into or incorporated into the general definition of negligence. And, you know, I see people taking notes, and this is a, a generational thing for me. It did not dawn on me until like six months ago, watching my younger colleagues do this. Something that works, if there's something that's interesting to you, you can just take a picture of it. Um, and so that, I just started doing that a few months ago. I feel so millennial and so with it, you know. So after 30 years of chicken scratch that I can't read later, and it's like, what was I thinking? Um, so, if there's something that's interesting to you, I will not be offended if, if you want to take a picture of it. Um, there's no, no copyright on the Washington pattern jury instructions. Um, but that's the standard that you're going to be governed by um, as a trip leader and you're going to be evaluated by is are you exercising um, reasonably, uh, are you exercising uh, what would be deemed to be the conduct of a reasonably careful person? under same or similar circumstances. And this is really the common sense definition that will guide a negligence case as it relates to you guys as, as trip leaders and volunteers. And that is, what is the rest of the industry doing? And you may be thinking, well, wait, I'm not part of the industry. I'm a volunteer. That's an argument that we, as the lawyers, will try to make to a jury. But if there's one thing that I can guarantee what the other side would be doing is that they would have an expert witness, undoubtedly someone who's got an ax to grind with volunteer organizations or an ax to grind with uh, the ski industry or uh, they're just uh, in a foul mood and willing to take money uh, to serve as an expert for the other side. Of course, we have to vilify these people. It makes us feel bad. Um, so, 
uh, but there will be an expert on the other side that will be saying that the, the similar circumstances and the standard of care relates to what actual professional guides with tens of thousands of hours of training under their belts, with PhDs in mountaineering, PhDs in backcountry skiing or climbing, that that's the standard that you should be held by. And like I said, that's a sobering, sobering thought. But the point of this presentation, as we'll talk about later, is not to leave you paralyzed with fear. It's just to make sure that you've got liability issues um, on your radar screen. But that's going to be the general standard. Okay. This is not only a big one, but I think that this is something that maybe some of you have likely dealt with in the past, is that you may be thinking, let's put it in the, uh, in the mountaineering context. I've got lots of friends um, in Seattle that are accomplished mountaineers, and invariably, my wife and I always tag along with them, especially at more uh, challenging objectives. I would rather sort of rely on them than rely on me. Um, and so you may be tempted as a group leader to sort of do things informally. And you may be thinking, well, these people are my friends and I never have to worry about liability issues down the road. But let's just imagine a scenario where, let's say that you're leading, uh, uh, or that you've got some friends and you're gonna backcountry ski for the day. And somebody gets caught, buried, and ultimately dies in an avalanche or that it's a, a mountaineering trip and someone ends up uh, taking this life for life and winds up uh, with a spinal cord injury and is paralyzed. If sudden, yes sir? So is this a formal mountaineer's trip we're talking about? Well, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna work into that. Thank you though, but, and thanks for, for focusing me here. But let's, <laughs> let's first off, let's, just, let's assume that this, let's first just call it a trip. We're not gonna call it a mountaineer's trip or a friend's trip. Let's just say we have a trip where someone winds up with a spinal cord injury and suddenly they've got $10 million uh, uh, in future medical bills that they're looking at because they need full-time assistance, they need a house that's been modified for their disability, they're gonna need uh, constant doctor visits, they've got very expensive equipment they need to have any type of life down the road. That's a scenario where a family member may be saying, well gee, this doesn't seem like a fringe trip to me, this seems like a mountaineer's trip, because the whole cold hard reality is that they may be looking at a lawsuit as the only possible way that they can uh, get their medical bills paid. And so what I'm suggesting to you is to be very, very cognizant that you keep your friend's life and your mountaineer's trips as very distinct and separate. So let's say that you as a group leader are approached by a couple of folks that you've met through the mountaineers, uh, that are mountaineers members, and they just rather than, so the way it works for you guys, so what happens, you advertise a trip, I say advertise, you post it, and then people sign up, and then there's a certain process that you go through, correct? Okay. You may be tempted to say, well, let's skip that process, and let's just have a trip with a few friends, and we're gonna do this informally, we're not gonna worry about the nuts and bolts that, I would normally, that you would normally associate with your mountaineers' activities. I really caution you about doing that because if something bad were to happen, then you may be looking at a scenario where you have a, a family member that is faced with millions of dollars in medical bills pointing at you and pointing at the Mountaineers and saying, oh no, this wasn't a French trip, this was a Mountaineers trip. And you're trying to convert it into a French trip just to protect yourself. So be very conscious that if it's friends, that it's not something that can be construed later as a mountaineer's activity. And I think there's probably some common sense ways that you can go about doing that. But if you're being contacted by people that are part of the mountaineers and they want to do something informally, um, and I'm sure that their, their intentions are, are good um, and, and they've probably got very good reasons for, for just wanting to do it informally, but I would suggest to you that if it's something that could even remotely be associated with the Mountaineers, go through the official steps 
necessary. So really be careful about that. Um, and I, I see some quizzical looks. It, it, does anybody have any questions about that particular issue? Yes, sir. One of the things that is fuzzy with the rise of social media is um, um, trips that are, are private trips. They're, they're not formal activities. But the gathering of the trip, the association, and the scheduling is done by through a Facebook page that is associated with the branch. That, and, that, and that continues to be fuzzy. And, and your explanation here isn't making it any less fuzzy. Well, and, and so let me be the, the, uh, the bearer of bad news. I say the bearer of bad news. What I would suggest is just simply, if it is being advertised um, in any, and when I say advertised, an argument can be made that a group text or a tweet or, uh, I guess you can't advertise on Instagram, because it's what it is. I'll ask these guys, Instagram is just a picture, right? No, <laughs> okay, so a little bit, of, but anything that could possibly be construed or associated with the Mountaineers, I would not, I, there's arguments to be made that that's not a private fringe trip. So uh, I hate to be uh, a wet blanket and a party pooper, but if it's something, it's one thing for you and a couple of your friends to sit down and say, hey, let's, we want to go up into the Goat Rocks or whatever the trip may involve. It's, that's informal. But once it's actually broadcast in some fashion, you're, you're flirting with disaster. And when I say disaster, I don't mean to be all doom and gloom and uh, melodramatic about it. That's just a, an expression. But you're, you're asking for trouble uh, and you're skirting the line there. So I think that's something you really need to be concerned about. Yes, sir. So are we trying to protect the mountaineers or are we trying to protect the participants of the trip? That one we're going to save for a few slides from now. Because when we talk about, because there are immunities and protections available to you as a mountaineer uh, or as a volunteer. But we'll, let, let's, I promise we'll address that. And this is how it, I think it would play out is that what the argument would be from someone, again, who's trying to reverse engineer things and prove it is a Mountaineers trip because they want Mountaineers insurance money. What the lawyers are gonna be saying is, well, that's form over substance. That's simply a CYA by just saying, oh, this isn't a Mountaineers trip. In substance, it is a Mountaineers trip. It was available to people that weren't even in this circle of friends, but it was available to people who were Mountaineers. These, uh, so-and-so was the trip leader that was making these decisions. So I think uh, the idea that you can sort of put a king's X on something by just saying this isn't a Mountaineers trip, what they're going to try to do is peel those layers of the onion and look beyond just the surface uh, pronouncement to see if uh, they can make out a case that it actually in reality was a Mountaineers trip regardless of how it's labeled. And I think that a distinction would be once it becomes available and is put out there as being available to people that are Mountaineers members that would fall outside of your immediate circle, then that's, that's asking for it. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, one final question. So one thing that social media is used for is, say, a group of friends go out and do that trip they describe. Uh, somebody joins and then they have trips, but they don't think the injury is too bad. Your group comes home and it's posted to a Facebook page or an Instagram or something like that for the Mountaineers branch because in some ways that's kind of encouraging participation and hey, let's get more people outside. So person who fell goes to the doctor and discovers that they tore ligaments in their ankle. Um, so it's an after the fact posting to social media, um, the Mountaineers. I would still think there's some liability there to put a picture up. I, I think that's the question is oh. after the fact, it, it's the after the fact posting as opposed to the pre-posting that I wonder about. I went out with friends, I took, but we happen to be associated with Mountaineers. We come back and say, hey, we had a great time. Let's share that we had a great time on Mountaineers social media. Does that open up any light? I don't think that is nearly as problematic as the other scenarios. Because if it is just a group of friends, and then, because, you know, after the fact, there's not an argument that can be made, well, this was available to the Mountaineers uh, sort of general population, or this was available to the Mountaineers, Tacoma branch, or whatever the argument that's going to be made. It would just be, hey, this was a group of friends that went out, one of them happens to be a member of the Mountaineers, or some of them are Mountaineers members, 
take a look at this. I think that that is a, um, if we're looking at a spectrum, and I think the scenario that the gentleman in the, and it's at a University of Kentucky hat, okay. um, the, uh, the Kentucky Wildcat uh, illustration, um, on a sliding scale with 10 being absolutely it's a Mountaineers trip and one there's no case to make, I would say your scenario is probably six or seven pointing towards, well, this could, arguments could be made that it's a Mountaineers trip and therefore Mountaineers uh, type liability could be incurred. I think an after the fact with just a group of friends, eh, that's a, to me, that seems like a very weak argument. I can't point you to a specific case or statute that would say that, but that would be one I think that there, it would be quite easy to defend. Yes, sir. I was just wondering about if the fact that there's no roster on which you you consciously register, which requires a waiver, that seems to me that if there's no roster requiring a waiver by all people that press the register button, then it's kind of not a Mountaineer's trip. Well, no roster. It, the, the argument contrary to that by people who are going to be uh, trying to reverse engineer this to get to the insurance money. I hate to keep repeating it, but that is what a lawsuit is all about. Um, what the argument is going to be is, no, this was a Mountaineer's trip, it was just a sloppy one. I mean, that's literally what they're going to say. And they're also going to be jumping for joy that there's no waiver. Um, so I think that who the trip is available to and how that is um, communicated mm -hmm. is much more important than let's say like the, the idea that you can use a phrase like this is not a Mountaineers trip this is just a French trip or well we didn't sign a waiver those sort of bright line kind of fixes um, I don't think get you nearly as far as you would hope mm -hmm. so I think you have to just be really careful if it's available and advertised or communicated to a group larger than just uh, an immediate group of friends or acquaintances that you can separate from the Mountaineers, I think that, uh, that some of these more superficial issues, and I'm not saying a waiver is superficial, but the idea, well, we didn't sign a waiver, so therefore it's not a Mountaineers trip, or we're gonna call it a fringe trip. Um, I think that that's what the, the other side is gonna say, is it's either a sloppy Mountaineers trip or it's form over substance, mm -hmm. so. Yes? Richard, could you address issues uh, where you as an individual and Mountaineers as an organization are dually liable? And is there such a circumstance? Yes, and we're going to, to follow up with, with uh, this gentleman's question here, when we actually get to the immunities in a few minutes, I'll, I'll do that. Okay. okay. Um, so, friends versus Mountaineers. Yes? Oh, I was just thinking that might be a follow up issue for the Mountaineers because as you're talking, I'm realizing. Somebody could legitimately argue when I scout with another leader or two that is, they could argue that it's the Mountaineers trip. And I don't want to post a trip and say, well, there's three of us, nobody else can come. So I think as a club, we just need to address that. I, and I do think that that is something that um, I would uh, talk with the leadership about. And Ruth or myself or our much smarter uh, associates at our office would be glad to really look at some sort of bright line policy in that regard, because I do think that's something that can be addressed through not through a policy. Um, okay, yes, uh, yes sir. I see a lot of instances every year where a group of people that, uh, will rent the, uh, a hut uh, for backcountry skiing, and then uh, one of their people, uh, one of their regular group will, can't come, so they'll advertise on a skiing forum uh, for a slot uh, to, to fill the slot with somebody else. That, that happens all the time. Sure. So, so what's the situation? And, and probably uh, almost all of the people are likely mountaineers. Well, if the forum is uh, Teton Gravity, then this is just some juvenile shenanigans, and so uh, that uh, juvenile law applies. I'm, I'm being silly. Does anybody even know what Teton gravity yeah, is? Yeah, it's like turns all year. Yeah, right? yeah. No, just because it's at, so the fact that it's sort of like a Venn diagram where everyone is a mountaineer, but this is being advertised on turns all year, I think that's fine. 
Because the argument, just because someone is a member of the Mountaineers and everyone is a Mountaineer that's on a trip, that does not make it a Mountaineers trip. What would make it a Mountaineers trip is if it is offered and available to uh, the Mountaineers community. And to me, that's the, that would be the bright line. So I think that like on, if you're advertising on Turns All Year or TGR or uh, Cascade Climbers or whatever site you're using, I think that's fine. I don't think that that would equate with something being a Mountaineers trip. And nine times out of 10, is this gonna be a hut in Canada? Yeah. Yeah, so you don't even need to worry about it. Yeah. Because um, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, one thing is for sure, in Canada, those waivers are enforceable. So, uh, and you're gonna sign one before you get on the helicopter to, I am a sophisticated consumer of Canadian ski services. Um, okay. Um, and I hate to do this, but maybe what, any other, yes sir, one more. So this is involving uh, being an instructor taking a climbing course, and in the courses there's a, a lot of emphasis on conditioning. So, and students have emails with instructors, so if a student sends out an email and say, hey, I'm going to go up on an outside on Saturday, you may want to go with me. So, because it's within the mountaineers, but it's not really going to make sure that's something that's effective. The second variation in that is have that same student say, hey, we're going to go up to Leavenworth, just go up the day early and I've got some pros, I'll, I'll start leading so we can get ready for the instruction. So, those two variances in the well, I, again, I think just because something is being communicated to people that are Mountaineers members, that doesn't make it a Mountaineers trip. But if someone is communicating where it is uh, accessible to all or a large portion of the Mountaineers community, I think that's when it starts getting sticky. And so... Um, The last thing you want to do is dampen uh, anyone's enthusiasm for outdoor activities and for being inclusive and getting other people involved. But I think that's problematic when someone who's not necessarily qualified to lead anything um, is adverti not advertising, but communicating on any type of Mountaineers forum. Hey, I'm going to go to Leavenworth tomorrow and do some climbing. So, and, and does anyone want to come along? I, what I would suggest, and, and you know, my job is not to set Mountaineers policy, but I think a reasonable approach to this would be, hey, we're not going to communicate on Mountaineers uh, forums and platforms unless it's a Mountaineers trip. That would be, to me, that would be one suggestion to, to how to approach that. That once you start getting a little bit looser with this, then the camel gets its nose under the tent and it really does start to open up a can of worms from a liability perspective. And, and uh, I am acutely aware that this is apparently a hot button issue and I'm gonna talk to my partner, Ruth Nielsen, about it. And my takeaway from today is that we really need, as the lawyers, need to think hard about some possible bright line guidance involving this issue. So, okay, um, I've only got like uh, 25 more minutes and. Uh, so we're, we're just, we'll keep moving, but keep asking questions, okay? Okay, um, sadly, if I were young and capable, the lettering at the bottom would be much better. I actually tried to fix this last night, and after like, I thought I'd lost the whole presentation like four times. <laughs> yeah. it. So I'm gonna put my glasses on and read you what the dark lettering says. If you can. Uh, I'm so sorry, this is embarrassing. Okay. Um, volunteer trap number three, I'm just the little guy, no one's going to sue me. There are reasons why individuals get sued all the time along with, you know, the analogy 40 years ago would have been along with IBM. Do you guys know what IBM is? <laughs> I love that, but I can stump the, the, the younger generation. So it used to be, or, you know, like, it's like rooting for the Yankees. Um, the idea that uh, a big corporation is going to be sued, and not that the Mountaineers is a big corporation, but the Mountaineers likely has better insurance protections than you do as individuals. Um, but the idea that why do I need to worry about that? Why are they going to sue me? I don't have anything. Well, there's some strategic reasons 
that you could wind up being sued that have absolutely nothing to do with your assets or your resources. So when you're a party in a lawsuit, um, evidence rules such as hearsay suddenly change. So there is a, uh, an evidence rule called uh, statement by party. So if your name is on the caption in a lawsuit, any uh, hearsay objections about what you said, those go out the window. Someone that is suing the Mountaineers may want to include you as a volunteer. And I know we also have some peripheral organizations, I say peripheral, some other organizations that, uh, that may be represented here today. The same applies for you. That your organization may be sued, but they will want to sue you as the individual, even though you have nothing, simply because they want to get past uh, like the hearsay rules, simply because they want you there at trial. Like you can force a party to attend trial, and then if they don't attend, you can get what's known as a default judgment, and that would allow the jury to say, and look at this, the trip leader's not even, uh, the lawyer be saying, the trip leader's not even here. You as jurors have to take up your time, and they care so little they don't even show up. So there's all sorts of strategic gamesmanship that goes into why you could be sued as an individual that really has nothing to do with your individual resources. And keep in mind, depending on the, the, the level of success with a certain firm that is pursuing a lawsuit, they may want to just try to ring. If your homeowner's policy provides, um, let's say, uh, $25,000 in coverage and they're seeking millions of dollars, they may want that $25,000 just because, well, we have to pay our experts up front, and that's a little bit of a, uh, uh, a war chest to move forward. And so don't rely on that, that you have absolutely nothing. In fact, when I was in college, I had absolutely nothing, and I did get sued. Um, and that's not why I went to law school. It's, there's, no, <laughs> there's, there's no big picture story there. It's just the fact that you, you can, there are strategic reasons that you can be sued that are totally independent of a lawsuit uh, or uh, resources. And something else to keep in mind, that there is a, you guys are a really tiny, tiny, tiny segment of the population that you view the outdoors, the mountains, as a wonderful, magical place where it's great to spend time. There's this whole big section of the population that thinks of the mountains as utterly terrifying. And but at the same time, they also um, view the outdoor environment from their perspective, which may be the Alderwood Mall or Bellevue Square. It's like, well, this should be tightly controlled, and everything is within your control, and you should be able to control things like avalanches. You should be able to control things like uh, hidden crevasses. And they may, the person suing you, they may be just doing this out of pure vindictiveness because they think that anybody involved in these mountain activities, uh, they would hold you to a, a totally unrealistic standard. So there's lots of reasons you can be sued even though you have nothing. So that's another, don't be thinking, I don't need to sweat this stuff because I have nothing. And it's also possible that if you have nothing that suddenly, what if you have a long lost relative that you never knew about and you get the ch uh, a notice in the mail, hey, there's $300,000 waiting for you in Roswell, New Mexico. Now granted, that really never happens, but as a lawyer, that's always the scenario that they would give us in law school. So, yeah, so sadly, volunteers do get sued. So let's get to some uplifting news. Okay, protections. So, um, depending on your stage in life, your season in life, you may have uh, homeowner's liability insurance. And homeowner's liability insurance is actually very helpful. You would be surprised at uh, how much protection is afforded you. you. You think, well, gee, just because I have a homeowner's policy, that's going to offer me some protection uh, leading a Mountaineer's trip? Well, it may very well. And I, I can't resist. I've, I, I was in the Marine Corps, and I've had USAA insurance for 28 years. They are absolutely wonderful. And uh, thankfully, I have not been sued since I've had USAA, but it, that, it would not surprise me if USAA would provide absolutely great protections for me. And what happens, like with your homeowner's policy, for instance, um, is that the insurance company would actually provide you a lawyer, and they would cover your, your damages up to a certain amount. 
And it may be that the way that the lawsuit would shake out is that the insurance company would offer like your policy limits and then the other side agrees to dismiss you. So that's protection number one, but that's not your best protection here. But that's something that you may think about, and at least when it comes time to renew your homeowner's policy, it may be worth just taking a look at it and asking your agent, hey, what kind of protections are afforded me in a, in a scenario where I'm a trip leader for the Mountaineers if I were to be named in a lawsuit? But um, the, the protection, the best protection available for you is the volunteer statute, and we're going to get to that in a second. But let's talk about liability releases real quick because this was a hot topic when I did this last year. So what I'm going to do first, we're going to work backward. Th these, are the, these are the general rules regarding releases, and then we'll actually take a look at the Mountaineers release that my partner Ruth drafted up and see where it stands regarding some of these issues. So first off, with releases, they don't work for minors. And for those of you taking pictures, I've got a large head. If my head is in the way, um, say well, I'm seven and three eighths is my head size. Um, so um, releases do not work for minors. But when we go back to the Mountaineers release that Ruth drafted up, and let's see if I can use the laser pointer here. Uh, there is a section that says. You see where it says, or the participation of any minor that I am signing on behalf of? Uh -huh. You may be thinking, well, why include that in language if it's not enforceable against the minor? Well, let me just give you a little scenario that we're dealing with right now at my office. So we represent Stevens Pass Ski Area. This is all public record. I can talk about this. We represent Stevens, uh, Stevens Pass Ski Area in a lawsuit um, where a young lady, unfortunately, on her senior trip at Garfield High, got paralyzed in a terrain park. Um, and if you happen to know any of the people involved, and this is suddenly ringing a bell, come talk to me after. But anyway, um, Stevens Pass is being sued, and the young lady signed a waiver both with her Garfield High uh, class, and then signed, not signed, but actually had a, a, there's a waiver on her ski ticket. And an issue that has arisen in the case is whether her parents can bring their own separate claims. And so she happened to be of age, and so uh, it's a little bit different set of circumstances, but if she had been 16, this provision where uh, any minor that I'm signing on behalf of, what that's been construed as by the Washington courts is that the parents, they can't sign away the waiver or the, the minor's right to bring a lawsuit. But the parents, by signing this, are acknowledging that they can't bring a lawsuit on their own behalf. And again, these lawsuits are just about money. And so if the parents don't have their own individual claim for loss of consortium and emotional damages, that has an impact ultimately on how much a case is worth. It also has an impact on the, on the kind of evidence that can be presented at trial, uh, so forth and so on. So um, that's rule number one, though, is that these uh, waivers are not enforceable as to minors. Now, um, how many of you lead trips where it is, uh, where there are a lot of minors involved, if not all minors? Okay, uh, 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 here's a question for you. Is it worth having the minor sign the release? Or they can't, but? Um, typically what happens is that the youth programs staff here at the club set up the trip and structure it and then they have a, a, an opportunity available for a leader who has a special youth leadership badge like myself and then I just slot into what they do so I haven't had to deal with the paperwork side okay, okay. and I've been told by the club okay everything's ready meet us at the trailhead take it from there um, what I would submit yes. is there are uses in defending a lawsuit for the waiver independent of actually releasing the Mountaineers or an individual volunteer from liability. And that is, like in this, in this Stevens Pass lawsuit, what we are arguing is that uh, it was assumption of the risk. It was a feature that she knew she was going to jump off the feature. She saw the feature, she talked to her friends about it, her friends were cheering for her, like, come on, you can do it. Not that, if they weren't egging her on in a mean-spirited way, but just like, hey, come on, you've never done this before, you can do it. So she knew what she was doing. And so the waiver in our case, even if it is not a blanket uh, uh, 
panacea that would get Stevens Pass dismissed. It's useful to, to demonstrate to jurors that she was aware that there were certain risks involved. So just because minors cannot sign a release that actually excludes liability, it's still well worth it to have their parents sign it. And uh, I think that the, uh, uh, there are lots of uses for a release independent of, okay, this fixes everything. Um, so that's, that's part one on a release, not enforceable as the minors. Oh, um, now this is an important point for you guys, and we'll talk about this in context with the volunteer statute in a second. Um, releases are only enforceable for negligence, not gross negligence. So gross negligence is not the failure to exercise ordinary care, it's the failure to exercise basically any care. The actual definition is slight care. And so I was trying to think of some scenarios uh, for you as trip leaders where there's a distinction between negligence and gross negligence. Let's keep it in the, um, the mountaineering context. Anybody led a trip up the Emmons Glacier on Rainier? Okay, so I would say that gross negligence would be the failure to actually rope up up the Emmons problem once you leave Camp Sherman. <laughs> that's a gimme. That's something that anybody can grasp in like two seconds. Okay, that's gross negligence. Um, whereas failing to put the rope on on the inner glacier, um, somebody could maybe argue. And I don't. I don't actually don't think that's. And I've uh, I've skied the inner glacier before without a rope, and it's. I would say reasonable minds can differ, but that's the difference between a negligence argument and a gross negligence argument. To put it in the backcountry skiing context, I would say whether you are doing a uh, snow analysis that involves actually digging a pit, uh, that's, and let's say someone is severely injured or killed in an avalanche, and you're the group leader. Failure to dig a pit or failure to conduct some sort of snow analysis independent of just looking at the Abbey forecast, maybe that's a negligence argument. Failing to ensure that everybody's got a properly functioning beacon, I would say that's gross negligence. So that's the, the difference is between gross negligence, I would equate with something that just anybody with an elementary understanding of an activity grasps, well gee, that's bad, versus something where reasonable minds can differ and there's gonna be a battle of experts on it. And so that's a very important concept for you guys to remember because it also relates to the volunteer statute. But gross negligence um, is not releasable via uh, a release. Um, and the release needs to be clearly labeled and you'll see here that um, right up here, Ruth, make sure it's called the Mountaineer Sign-In and Liability Release. Because the idea is that you don't want a release um, where someone can argue later, well, I didn't know what I was signing. It was buried in the context of another document. So if the release is contained within six pages of other rules, guidelines, regulations, that's problematic. Or something like this, if this is the page, this is crystal clear, and I would suggest to you that the way that this one is drafted, that there's a high likelihood that this would be enforced. Um, and then, it says an acknowledgement of specific and general risk involved. And the amount of detail that you want to put in a release, like uh, Mount Baker Ski Area has one where you read the release and you would swear Mount Baker should change its name to House of Horrors. Because the stuff that can happen to you in Mount Baker, while it's all true, I mean, I think they even have, you know, lightning strikes. There's a, an, an, a, a, a huge laundry list of, uh, of woes that can befall you at Mount Baker. And by throwing all that stuff in, I think that's helpful, but you'll see here in the one that Ruth has drafted for the Mountaineers, I think that this actually is just fine. It says, uh, any outdoor activity may involve certain dangers, including but not limited to the hazards of traveling in mountainous terrain, accidents, illness in remote places, forces of nature, and here's the big one, and the actions of participants and other persons. So, um, that is amply sufficient, but the more detail that's included in a release, the better. And I know last year I had a lot of questions from people that were in other organizations about, well, what should we include in our release? 
And you know, I dropped the ball. There were several of you that emailed me about taking a look at things, and I kept putting you off. Is anybody in the room here today that that happened to last year? Okay, well, I, I'm sorry if uh, I, 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 you know, it's like suddenly April becomes July, and it's like, oh gosh, I forgot completely about that. So, uh, okay. So now let's let's get down to the absolute best news, which is your immunity as volunteers. So the Washington State statute provides you protection that in your volunteer status, you are immune. Now getting back to this gentleman's question about, well, does that mean we're protecting ourselves or protecting the Mountaineers? You will see down here at the bottom, nothing in this section shall be construed to affect the liability or vicarious liability of any nonprofit organization. So even though you, the individual, may be immune, then the mountain, it, that has no bearing on protecting the Mountaineers. And so from a mindset perspective, even though you're thinking, okay, I may be immune from negligence liability, I want to comport with the standard of care for my particular activity so I can protect an organization that is worth protecting. But also, keep this in mind, and, and you would be amazed at how often this comes up. With the volunteers, the harm was not caused by willful or criminal misconduct or gross negligence. So it may, or reckless misconduct, conscious labor and indifference to the rights or safety of the individual harmed by the volunteer. The creativity that lawyers will employ to try to get beyond the volunteer immunity, it's uh, astonishing. And so um, there are protections out there and I would submit that 90% of the time when we're talking about mistakes that could have, or mistakes that were potentially made at, by a troop leader or a trip leader, then we're talking about negligence rather than gross negligence. And you as the individual will likely be protected, but keep in mind they may sue you anyway and try to make it into a gross negligence case. So therefore, put those, uh, make sure that everybody's roped up on the Emmons. That, uh, better safe than sorry and you don't want anybody second guessing your actions. And not that you should have the perspective that this is all about CYA, but I think that you do want to be conscious that I'm gonna dot every I, dot every T, I'm gonna belt and suspender things, especially when kids are involved. So I think that's a good, a good rule of thumb. Um, but the protections that are afforded you as an individual, uh, trip leader, volunteer, they're there for negligence, but there are also arguments to be made that people may try to drag you into a lawsuit and claim that it was gross negligence and that the immunities available um, as a volunteer for negligence aren't applicable. So let's talk about something that's a, a little uh, grimmer. Okay. Um, what is not going to be uh, uh, included in the volunteer immunities are these types of things that nobody should be engaged in. And uh, what I would suggest to you is that um, if you, and, and I know none of you are like this, but I'm sure you've met people like this before. If someone has to uh, talk about sexual things, denigrate someone about their sexuality, their appearance, their ethnicity, etc., if someone has to do that to have fun out in the mountains, that's really not someone you want to hang out with anyway. Um, but that stuff will get you in trouble. And so things like sexual harassment or uh, inappropriate comments that can be construed in some way as uh, that would possibly be considered uh, malicious harassment, anything like that, that um, has nothing to do with the immunity statute and negligence. Because those aren't, that's not negligence. Those are intentional torts. And before I answer your question, let me find, um, where is she? Maybe she left. Um, somebody wanted me to talk about the uh, role that emails, social media, et cetera, can play in a lawsuit. So even in the negligence context, not necessarily talking about inappropriate things, but talking about like debriefing some sort of catastrophic incident, Keep in mind that there is nothing that you put out there on the internet that is private. Um, 
not only does the technology allow recovery of something that you think may be deleted, but keep in mind that when there's a, the discovery process in a lawsuit, that's now the first thing that the other side, and that's the first thing I ask for, is give me all your emails, give me your text messages, give me you know, social media, et cetera, et cetera. So what I would suggest to you is you really want to have a, uh, not only a literal filter, but you want to have a figurative filter to everything you put out there on social media. And you know, what I found over the years, and I'm highly conscious of this, you can still have fun with social media and communicate with your friends and with your family with, with stuff that totally withstands scrutiny. It's amazing. I, I mean, my rule is basically if it doesn't involve like vacations or dog pictures, then uh, I don't put it on social media. But, uh, and we can include cats in there as well. My wife, well, we have two big dogs, but she spends endless hours watching these cat videos. Uh, so, um, uh, but be very conscious that anything that you put out there via email, via social media, that that's something later you could find yourself in front of a jury of 12 strangers trying to explain, well, what I really meant was, or, this was all in fun, or they were joking with me first, because things can get twisted around and get ugly in a courtroom uh, very quickly, where perceptions really do become reality, regardless of the factual basis. So I really want to caution you about things like, and, and I mean this goes without saying about the, you know, vulnerable adults, sexual abuse of minors, failure to accommodate disabilities. I know this is stuff that all of you are cognizant of, but when it comes to the social media and with email, uh, text messages, uh, and, and, and again, I'm acutely aware of these things and I still manage to live my life and communicate with everybody and I don't have any issues. So, um, we're about out of time, but we got a couple minutes, yes? So, if there's been an incident that there was no, in, there was a minor injury that required the following care, would and my co-leader and I discussed this via emails. You're saying that we should now be doing that on the phone because those could potentially be subpoenable. How do you say it works? Discoverable. Yes. Discoverable. Yes. Yes. Discoverable is a yeah. If, if, if there had been a, a future issue with this event, you're saying it should be on the phone as opposed to paper trail? Well, let me frame it this way. All I can tell you is that if you type it out and press send, that that could be something that somebody's going to scrutinize. That's uh, all, all I can. Uh, I, I don't want to tell you, like, hey, you should limit this to just strictly phone conversations, but that stuff could be discovered. No, it's getting smart. It will change behavior, and that's Yeah, and, and so being, and, that, and, and I think that's the big takeaway for everything today, guys, is that just be aware that these liability issues are lurking. And the best way to avoid those is by really relying on your training. You guys get fantastic training. I don't care where I go. Um, if somebody sees, uh, I have a feathered fringe jacket. I had an Australian guy, I, went, I was lucky enough to go to Japan skiing last year. And by the way, that's fantastic. If any of you get the chance, you should do it. Um, I, I went to Japan skiing and I had a feathered fringe jacket and some guy from Australia was like, hey, are you from Seattle? I'm not gonna try to find out the accent. That's not gonna happen. But he's like, hey, are you from Seattle? Yes. And he's like, uh, started talking about the Mountaineers and the Freedom of the Hills book. And so this really is uh, a, an august organization. And you guys uh, really literally wrote the book about so many of these outdoor pursuits. And if you just do things in accordance with your training, exercise a little common sense, and just be aware of these liability issues lurking, you're going to be fine. You don't need to be paralyzed by fear. Be a volunteer. Keep at it. And uh, uh, go out there and have some fun. So one more question, then we got to quit. So it's a great presentation. I noticed you talked a lot about trips, not about courses. So one of the great things about being a mountaineer is anyone can create a course. And anyone can teach self-rescue, avalanche, medical stuff. Um, so it's kind of a two-part question. For example, I'm in emergency medicine and I've been in emergency medicine for over 10, 10 years. Yes. And I've been approached on numerous occasions about teaching some of those skills um, to trip leaders in a non, not offering like EMT or first aid or, or certification of those, but just 
some of those skills. Where does liability come in for teaching some of these more technical skills in a non-official or creative courses and things like that? Well, I think, it's, I think that there's two potential ways that that can play out. First would just be somebody getting hurt in the course. And if someone is hurt in the course, then it, the way that you're going to be scrutinized and the way that it's going to be evaluated is just, well, gee, the way that you were conducting the course, was it being conducted in a reasonably safe manner based upon the standards that somebody is going to point to related to how these courses are taught? The other way that it could come up is later, if a trip leader were to employ some sort of uh, technique or procedure that they learned in one of these courses and then that resulted in someone being hurt, then they may just point at the course as uh, uh, evidentiary substance as to why this person was improperly trained. So it's kind of a two-fold issue, um, and I, but I think that it, it's, the analysis is no different than an actual uh, trip. It's like, okay, am I conducting this course in a manner uh, that is in accordance with what would be reasonable standards and is the information that I'm imparting, the education that I'm imparting, is it sound and is it generally accepted in the community? So kind of the follow up on that, so it can go to self-rescue, avalanche training, things like that, but in my specific case it's medical training. So if I am state certified and I'm a trained instructor and I'm providing some of these medical skills to other trip leaders in a specific course provided by the Mountaineers that we've created, as long as those are proper protocols and first aid training, that's not like a professional skill that's reasonable? Or well, and, and I am hesitant to ask that or answer that because what I don't know, so the Washington Administrative Code has these administrative rules set up, and in, in a medical context, man, there's a myriad of them. And I don't know if there is an actual provision that says that for any kind of medical training to be imparted, that there's a certain certification required of the instructor. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, that's not going to be the case typically with other types of education like rock climbing uh, skills or uh, avalanche training skills, etc. But I think, in the, especially in a medical context, that's something you want to confirm and that you uh, that there's not something that says there's a bright line as to who's qualified and who's not. Yeah, I, I'm sorry to pass the buck on that. Yeah, well, 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 guys, I'm sorry. I, I've got to wrap this up. Um, I appreciate your time and thanks for all the input and especially about the friends issue. Ruth and I are